Hi there, everybody. It looks like we are live, so welcome. I'm Scott with Artist Network. This is Drawing Together. We see a nice audience forming here. We're here to draw the owl today, and as you all um, seem to have gathered, uh, looking at the discussion feed here, we're working on toned paper. I've got my charcoal pencils. I've got white chalk that I'm going to be using on top of it to pull out some of the lights there. And I also have uh, my vine charcoal that I'm going to be using for some of the initial stages, as well as my uh, my rubber and kneaded erasers and my shading stump. Um, we've been using a lot in uh, throughout this whole series. So welcome everybody. If you're new, uh, the uh, image that we're working from is in the description below. So feel free to follow along if you'd like, um, or just watch and complete this on your own uh, later on. But I'm really looking forward um, to uh, to this uh, this drawing here. I did this preparatory one to kind of wrap my head around. Um, ultimately what this drawing is about and what kind of bubbled to the surface here is the idea that you know in trying to capture the the texture of the owl it um, it confronts the idea of trusting your materials and allowing the materials to do what they do naturally I think in, in a lot of ways we we try to kind of control the charcoal control the chalk and get it to do what we want it to do um, but in something like this there's so much happening on the bird there's so many kind of fine details that we have available to us that it kind of forces us to allow the materials to do what it does naturally so that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on this um, a lot of positive and negative drawing and negative space in this um, image. Um, we're going to be dealing a little bit with proportion, although it's kind of less critical with this one. You know, I think it's if we really focus on texture and, and, and kind of value control and, and really controlling the materials, I think the proportions are going to work themselves, themselves out throughout this whole drawing. So, um, so hopefully everybody is on. I have some questions about uh, some of the questions uh, about whether we're live. We should be going live. Everything seems to be... Um, um, coming through so hopefully it looks like everything's live here but if anybody's experiencing any issues let me know um, feel free to, to post in here so there may be a little um, uh, little lag in, in the in the live stream here so I'm just going to go through quickly to see if um, see if there's any questions Jade is asking how can we put a drawing uh, put on a drawing a signature um, that's an interesting question. It's somebody I don't think a whole lot about signatures, especially in this whole series. These are exercises that I've, I've come up with to help me develop my skills and then share it with, uh, with the group so that we can kind of all build our skills together. So as a result, I don't necessarily sign any of these. These are, these are meant for kind of my own, uh, you know, my own skill development. Uh, but even with painting, I, I don't often sign the works or if anything, I put it on the back. And one of the things that I like, I, that I think about is that you know, throughout this whole drawing, we're carefully considering the marks that we're making, controlling the values, and in the an example of painting, we're controlling our color work. Um, and then what can sometimes happen is that that signature can feel almost arbitrary on top of that, kind of go against all that control we've had in constructing the scene. And to me, it can it almost kind of pull me out of the image. So that's why I tend to sign things on the back. But that's just my own personal preference. Um, so, but in general, what I like to see signatures that are subtle. Um, and, and don't interfere with the drawing so that the first thing you see is, is the, the image, not the signature. Um, so, but that's, again, that's my, my own take on it. Um, so we're gonna get right into it. If you do have any questions, um, feel free to, to type them out in all caps. I will see them more easily because we do get a lot of um, comments coming through throughout the, uh, the series. So I'm gonna set this aside here and we're gonna get started. So I'm gonna pick up my vine charcoal and I wanted just to start thinking through the basic proportions. And one of the things that I had done in advance and I observed in the initial um, um, approach to this drawing is that the, the face that there's, you can see that, that ring around the face, and you know, it's got, it's got this kind of heart-shaped uh, form to it, but it's generally the same height as it is the same width. And so I want to start to kind of map that out using the side of the pencil because I want to try to start, start to think in terms of shape rather than line. Um, and what I found most helpful is to try to think about that negative space uh, initially. So kind of blocking in that darker background and leaving the shape of the bird on, uh, you know, in the negative space between there um, and try to get to that sense of shape early on. 
uh, what um, we talk about that a lot in this series. The idea is if, if we're going for realism in a drawing, um, getting away from the use of contour lines is really helpful because contour lines don't exist in nature. There's they're symbols that we've created as humans to represent the edge of an object. Um, and, and especially with this subject, we have a, a kind of a, a reverse silhouette, a kind of an inverted silhouette in the sense that it's, it's largely light against a darker background. Um, and if we allow those edges to be formed through value relationships rather than a contour line, it's going to help us to bring our attention into the, into the middle um, into the, the center area of focus, that expression, the, especially that texture right in the, in the middle of the beak there. Um, if we outline the bird too much, those edges tend to pop out and, and can end up flattening out that form. So that's why I like to take this approach, just kind of blocking it in, seeing how it fits on the page. Now I have my, I have an 11 by 14 sheet of paper here and I have it horizontally aligned. I could have had it vertical, um, but just, you know, for, for the sake of the camera and the scale that I want to work at, I, I just kept it horizontally here. So you may want to be working um, uh, vertically on this. And so this is, in a way, very gestural. I'm just thinking about blocking in these major forms so they have something to react to. And as we know about vine charcoal, it's very light. And I'm just using my palm to wipe that down rather than using my uh, oily fingers. And I'm just trying to block in some major form. So one of the things that really became apparent in the initial study that I did is how one of the, the gestalt principles of the law of good continuation is, a, is evident in this. And it becomes a, a key factor in rendering this. And I want to talk a bit about what that is. But um, in, when studying design, we learn um, the gestalt principles, the principles of design that allow us and kind of give us a language for um, describing how we interpret visual information. And, and one of those laws is what's called the law of good continuation, the idea that our brain pieces together little bits of um, information and interprets it as a, as a larger shape. And the, the, the best example of that is that of constellation. So we look at these dots across the sky and our brains are primed to interpret that as a pattern and come up with some sort of image. And so with that principle in mind, we can create lines by creating paths of smaller marks rather than one continuous line. And we really see that here around that, that um, I don't even know what that, that's called, but that, that, that ring around the eyes of the owl is that it's not a line. We see that as a form but it's it's all very subtle and it's formed by by the texture kind of being arranged in such a way that our brain pieces that together as that kind of circular or kind of heart-shaped form if that makes sense and so we're going to kind of get into that i'm kind of lightly mapping it out kind of i'm going to lightly map out the center but again i want to be um i want to make sure that i'm not thinking too much about line at this point Kind of block in generally where the eyes go. Squinting is really helpful at this point because um, it helps you to prioritize value relationships. And I don't want to I don't want to create one continuous mark throughout this this drawing. And what's really going to be profound in this, I think, is that contrast between kind of the glassiness of the eyes. How smooth they are, and they really—it really pulls our our own eye into the into the drawing, into the subject. That that glossiness contrasted against the um, the the texture of the feathers there. Um, and then working with the toned paper, the the paper itself has a particular value to it. And one of the things that we've talked about throughout this series is that our our brains kind of calibrate to the value relationships we're seeing on there. And so one of the things to be mindful of is that as we start to lay the darks down here and we start to immerse ourselves in the drawings, our brain is going to have a tendency to calibrate to the toned paper and start to interpret that as a highlight. But we're going to be coming back in on top of it with our white chalk to kind of create a new context for those value relationships. It's going to pull out that contrast and those whites are really going to pop. And I've just found that, in general, when working with toned paper, 
um, when we stick with the darks for a, a while and then add the lights towards the end, um, it ultimately becomes a stronger um, dynamic rather than introducing the lights early on. So, you know, one of the one of the things we could have done here is started by laying in the lights on top of the of the toned paper and then adding the darks. But I found that the um, it's it's more effective generally to um, to start with the dark forms. So I'm just going to reduce the scale a little bit. It's one of the advantages to working in this method is is right now I. I I've got the camera zoomed in a little bit, so it's cropping off some of the top. Um, and rather than reset the camera, I'm going to shrink everything in the drawing. Um, Sharon is asking, is white pastel pencil able to substitute for the white chalk? I believe it will. It should work just fine. Um, because if we're, doing it, um, if we're doing it in a controlled manner, uh, then the, the white chalk will be on top of the, the brown paper, and it won't be mixing with the charcoal. One of the things that happened in the preparatory one is that I, uh, I, there are a few areas where it mixed and it created this kind of flat gray that um, you know, I was able to work with, but it was, wasn't quite ideal. So I want to be mindful of that when I do this, is, is um, cleaning off the paper a little bit more before I add the chalk. But with that in mind, yes, I think the pastel will work just fine. So I think that, that's framing it a little bit better in the, the camera for you guys. Um, again, just checking. Okay, no more other questions, but again, um, keep asking them. I love to hear your, um, your responses to this. You know, as you're drawing along, what are you responding to? What is working? What's not? But you can see at this point, it's already forming. We could, we could stop right now and somebody could say, hey, that looks like an owl. Now, it wouldn't quite be, you know, a, a, a you know, finished drawing by any means, but you know, that's the kind of the mindset I like to approach my drawings with is, is um, building the whole thing up at once. So trying to get at the, the basic structure of the form quickly um, so then we can continue to react. So now I'm going to use my, my kneaded eraser um, and kind of flip my thinking. I'm going to start drawing the shape of the in, in silhouette of the bird here. Uh, and I'm not going to be too precise with matching the texture one-to-one -one with the... Uh, the photo reference. I, I want to kind of capture that overall essence, kind of like a gesture. Uh, and again, one of the things I like to think about in the series is that I'm, I'm developing these drawings, I'm doing these exercises to help me improve my painting and drawing on location. So even though I'm working from a, from a photo reference, I'm trying to build hand-eye coordination, um, build my familiarity with the materials, practice these things so that when I'm on location and working from life that um, it, it happens more quickly. And so that's the reason why I'm not gritting off, I'm not tracing, I'm not transferring because it's not about it's not about creating the image, it's about the act of drawing that is mostly that, that, I, that I want to focus on and developing these skills because when I'm in the field I'm not going to have the ability to, to trace the image or use a grid or things like that that would lead to a more precise drawing. I'm, what, right now what I'm trying to do is I'm focusing on that basic structure here, kind of refining that silhouette a little bit because something seems a little bit off. So I can look at this and what I have, I have it too wide. So generally the height from that bottom edge of the ring, basically just below the beak to the top, that height is, should be about the same as the width of that kind of ring around there. And so if I set this height and turn it sideways, then that ring would come in here. So I just need to come in just a little bit uh, more to manage those proportions a little bit. I got to remember to squint. And I'm just kind of tapping on the page here, rather than drawing a line. I don't want to, I don't want to be drawing a hard line, and I, I'm not putting a whole lot of thought into into those marks. Just kind of dropping it where I see a kind of a darker value, and then in the as we develop the drawing in that process, the uh, all of those marks would hopefully translate into texture. This comes into um, and relates to what we we're talking about in terms of trusting the materials, trusting your observations. 
um, reacting to this subject, but allowing the material to kind of do what it does. And so as I start to lay in these marks, I'm mostly thinking about, you know, is it dark, is it light, what is that basic shape? But I can also start to think about what the general flow is of the, of the feathers. So in here, for example, they're kind of longer and they're kind of flowing more down and I'm just allowing my marks to, to suggest that as well. And utilizing the side of the material tends to create more natural looking marks. If we start to bring in lines and use the point, then we start to control that a little bit more and um, we lose that sense of texture a bit. Uh, Sharon is asking, does setting up the darker background, which you have always seemed to do first, make it easier to slowly get to the details in the center? That does, that does make sense, Sharon, and I think it, that it does. Because what can happen, and I've talked a bit about this in some of the previous um, episodes, is that once we get into the details, you know, we get really kind of locked into the drawing um, and, and into that one particular area. Um, and I think it's important to set that area up and make sure that the rest of the context is, is, is comfortable. Um, and so I want to make sure that before I get into any of the details, that the basic forms are there and then also the basic value relationships are there. So then as I'm making my lights and my darks in here, in my peripheral vision, I'm taking in the rest of those values and, and I'm making those decisions in the context of something. If this was a tan paper and I add those darks, my eyes are going to be calibrating to that relationships and it's going to interpret those darks as being darker than they actually are. And so I need to build everything up so that I'm constantly checking those relationships in terms of value and that they're in the context of everything else in the drawing. So ho hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so I think at this point, again, I've got the, uh, that layer of vine charcoal. Um, and you can see that I'm not, try I'm not being precise at all in the way accidental marks can really work to our advantage in this uh, process here. And so I, I, as long as I kind of get the general form right, and I let the materials kind of do what they do, react to it in a gestural way, there's a, a chance that some of these marks will suggest a texture that I could never achieve by, by sharply focusing and, and providing some detail on there. Um, so I think um, uh, homemade food be rocking. I'm using colored pencils, is that okay? Absolutely, go for it. Um, there's really no kind of requirement here. This is what I'm using, but you know, this is all about us coming together to, uh, to work. And so hopefully some of these, um, some of these uh, principles that we'll be talking about are applica uh, applicable to colored pencil as well. And one of the challenging things that can happen with colored pencils is that it can be difficult to fill in a broad area quickly. And that's one of the reasons why I like to use charcoal for this series is that I can get to the point where I'm filling in a large area in a matter of seconds using charcoal, whereas graphite or colored pencil may take longer. Um, and it also doesn't quite show up on camera very well uh, when I use graphite. So I've kind of adopted the, the charcoal, but hopefully you're all discovering that if, if you're using um, uh, graphite as well, uh, you know, or you, it, these, um, these ideas are all transferable. Uh, so now what I'm doing is I'm laying in using my compressed charcoal pencil just um, a more permanent value here and with that layer of vine charcoal this compressed charcoal kind of floats on it pretty smoothly um, and as you could see what I was what I was doing is I'm I'm trying to lock my wrist when I do this using the side of the pencil and I'm, I'm constantly rolling it in my fingers so that then that contact on the page, that, that, that charcoal is, is always kind of reaching a new flat point. I don't want to have it flat on one side and create a ridge that and then they have to confront later on. And so I'm constantly rolling it and what that does is it also sharpens the pencil at the same time. And then I'm changing directions so there's a bit of a cross hatching approach here. Um, so I'm kind of working at an angle, maybe horizontally, um, more vertically. Um, with this bird being mostly vertical, I think it's going to be most helpful to prioritize horizontal marks. And that's going to be 
um, helpful in establishing the basic spatial relationships. So when I when I darken these areas, that it's going to read as being uh, behind the bird. It's using kind of an overlapping principle. All right, so fairly soft edges there. And you can see just by the nature of the materials, it's starting to suggest the texture of those feathers along that edge. And this, again, comes into where, what I was talking about earlier about trusting the materials and, and allowing them to kind of just do what it does. And, and then from there, we can adapt our drawing to kind of capture the essence of the bird rather than you know looking closely at that reference photo and then try to render one little feather and then move on to the next. Um, having said that, if that's the way you prefer to work, if you like to work in a more controlled, methodical way, um, go for it. There's no right or wrong. Um, I just want to explain kind of my approach and see what works for you and kind of go from there. Uh, Mary, you're asking about the eraser being a drawing implement. That's exactly true, and that's something that I'm glad you brought that up because it is something that I mentioned a lot in, in, in the previous episodes is that every material, every material you have, every object you have in drawing is an opportunity to contribute to the form. So the charcoal, the erasers, the shading stumps, they're, they're all tools to help you express your understanding of what that form is, make corrections, um, and, um, and and lead to a, a, an understanding of that, you know, kind of refine the uh, refine the subject. Um, so, for you know, when you're picking up the eraser, kind of r remember that, and then you can use that as an opportunity to actually create the marks and and create the, the the feathers here, and not just kind of correct mistakes. You know, that's something that we often are taught growing up is that erasers are about correcting things and removing something so you can start all over again. Instead, it's about um, thinking uh, in a more sculptural way where you're carving with the eraser and you're building with the charcoal. It's a positive and negative relationship there. Um, all right. Yeah, homemade for food. Yeah, it's kind of hard using my Prismacolor Premier Color Pencil of 150 set. I can imagine yeah, that is a that is a challenge. I have a lot of respect for you, um, colored pencil artists. I, I filmed a course with Gary Green, who wrote um, some books uh, for us for um, on colored pencil, and it was uh, quite an education on them and. Um, I had a, a lot of respect for the amount of focus and concentration and patience that color pencil um, kind of lends itself to. Okay, so I'm, now again, I'm kind of continuing to focus on that basic form. Um, now what I want to do is work from the inside out. Uh, I've got the that basic center line established, but it's not in the right not in the right spot. And it's helpful now because I have that mark on there, I have something specific that I can look at and make a specific decision about what needs to change. It's too far to the right. So I need to move it over to the left a little bit. Um, and you can see how I'm holding the pencil in kind of an overhand grip. The, there are several ways that I do that. You know, you can hold it like this, basically put the pencil on the, pa on the paper, grab it with your fingertips. That gives you a basic overhand grip. And I'm just kind of rolling my hand like this, and I'm doing that because it allows me to get kind of vertical right now. Um, but I also like to hold it like this sometimes, kind of, uh, kind of like a chopstick where it's wedged between my fingers and I can apply pressure with my thumb and I can control it with my fingers, but I still have the side of the pencil engaged. But it lends itself to kind of a horizontal orientation. So I'm gonna switch my grip to this overhand so I have pressure being applied with the, um, my, my index finger, um, have control back in here um, and what I want to do is just kind of tap down along that where I see the center axis of the, the bird being uh, because it's, it's an area that is visible and it's easy to interpret it as a line, but it's not really. It's an area that's thin and vertical and dark. And so I'm, what I'm trying to do is react in a gestural way to establish that. And utilizing the side of the pencil can be really helpful. So right in here, we see these longer feathers that come in on top. 
and they kind of scoop in towards the beak. So I can change the direction of my marks to kind of reflect that orientation of those feathers. And I'm not going to be too precise because we're going to come back in on top of that with the, uh, the, with the white chalk. So as you're doing this, as you're making your darks, I'm looking for those areas, trying to see where, where there are these darker areas, but I'm also paying attention to the flow of that texture. So then I can orient my materials to that flow, and out of that, the texture um, of the bird will kind of emerge. And I see that my original placement of the eyes was perhaps a bit small and a bit too high, so I can lower them down. So as I'm going through, as I'm going through, I'm looking back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing. And I'm trying to uh, evaluate where, where I am in the drawing. So as I'm making the drawing of the eyes, I'm looking at the shape I'm drawing, but I'm also trying to examine where I am in the context of the rest of the bird. You know, so that I'm looking at the beak area, make sure I'm in the right spot generally. I'm looking at the central axis here that maybe I've, I might have overcompensated and been pushed off to the left a bit too much. And I'm trying to, in general, get that right placement. This is throwing me off a little bit right in here, so I'm going to lower that. But hopefully this is making sense in terms of the direction of your marks. Um, I think it's really helpful to, to really kind of just pause and think about the, the flow of things um, and, and react to that. I see a question about, do I need to use a kneaded eraser? Uh, I don't think you necessarily need to, There's, that pun was intended, um, but the I find it helpful because it is a, a tool that you can shape and create kind of irregular forms with that are more likely to lend themselves to inter being, ter being interpreted as texture. Whereas a rubber eraser, because it's a rectangular in format, it tends to, uh, it tends, it tends to lend itself to um, uh, being interpreted as a kind of a rectangular mark, a linear mark. Okay, so as you can see, I'm kind of floating around the drawing. So I'm working a little bit on the eyes, checking the distance. I feel like this comes in a little bit too close. And I think this could come out a little bit more. but I'm trying not to be too um, persnickety here. I don't want to get bogged down in the details. Um, I think a lot about how my, what my brain is doing. And when we shift the detail, I notice a shift in the mind where everything kind of gets focused in, um, everything else shuts down around it. And so, um, and I know once, once I get into that mode, it becomes very difficult to maintain an understanding of the overall context. We lose, it's the, the forest for the trees um, situation where we get focused so much on drawing an individual feature that we lose sense of, of the whole. Um, and so I want my brain to not get into that mode at this point. So I'm just going to make a few little marks and then move on to the next part. And when I, before I make a mark or as I'm making a mark, I'm also thinking about the areas around it. Where am I relative to those other forms? Does it all make sense? Does it seem to be holding up in terms of those proportions? Starting to make observations about the changing texture throughout the bird. So if you notice in here, for example, inside the, the face, you see these longer, uh, kind of finer uh, feathers, and then you come around this, this kind of scruff here, and then all of a sudden they're shorter and, and more densely packed um, and so I want my marks to change as a reflection of that. And, and a lot of that can be achieved by simply kind of holding that, that gesture in your mind and allowing your marks to kind of reflect that. You know, try not to overthink it too much and try to and over render it. Just kind of go with it. 
So in here, it's that change in texture, so I'm going to allow those marks to change. They're gonna be shorter, kind of chunkier marks. Again, utilizing the side, I'll have that sharp point available to me when I need it. And then below it, and then we get kind of a silkier kind of um, area. Um, and things kind of flow more uh, more down in this area here. So it's just kind of changing your marks in reaction to the um, the basic texture and structure of the, the of the form. And a lot of information gets carried through that, just that, that simple observation. Um, again, kind of trusting your marks so that it, to, to, to reflect those observations and see what, um, see what texture emerges. All right. Sight measure eyes. Yes, I, that is something I need to be doing as well. That's a good point. Um, who said that? Rosalie. Yes, sight measuring, of course, is a, is a tool that we've we've talked about a lot in this series, um, and I haven't utilized that yet. So I'm still kind of reacting to those forms, but sight measuring them will help to refine the size and the placement of them. And so let me kind of work my way back around up here. Um, to try to, you know, and then work my way back in. Again, I wanted to, I want to make sure I'm jabbing at these areas and then moving on and not getting bogged down in, in, in any one area at this point. Um, so as we come back into that, so sight measuring the eyes, what you might do is, I've got the reference image in, in, the, in the screen in front of me off to my left here, closing one eye, and I'm using my pencil to gauge the height of the eye. So I'm holding my, my arm out vertically so there's no change in distance between my eye and the pencil, closing one eye so that everything flattens out, I get monocular vision. I'm using my finger and the tip of the pencil to, get it to indicate the height of the eye. And I'm gonna measure the, this, the gap between the eyes and it should be about one and a, about one and three quarters. It's not quite two eye widths apart. So if I take that, go one, it's pretty close. I think I need to come in a little bit here, and a little bit here. I can take that same height and I can measure up. And so from the height of the eye, it's two eye heights to the top of the head. So one, too. So I'm in pretty good shape there. And I, right now I'm thinking more generally as long as I, and then we'll continue to refine that. One, two, and then it's about two eye heights to the bottom of that scruff. So if I take this, there's one, two. So what that means is that that bottom of that scruff should probably come up to about here. And so if you're, if you're working in your drawing and you're making those corrections, or you always have two things, two options available to you. I could have adjusted the scale of the eyes to then fit the overall form of, that I had established in the rest of the body. Um, but I chose to leave the eyes as they are and build the proportions around them. And that feels a little bit better And I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to have to refine this a little bit. This gets really kind of subtle in here. So I'm going to be paying attention to that. And I might need to, might need to make some minor adjustments as we go. Something to keep in mind, I, I, again, in the, in the interest of trying to build up the whole drawing at, at once, you're constantly refining. Everything on the page is open to adjustment at this point. Um, it is helpful to anchor. So if I say, all right, the eyes are, are going to be, they're going to stay there and I make adjustments around them, uh, then, you know, they, then that can sometimes be helpful. But even then, you know, sometimes you get to a point where you're like, you know, I need to make a change to those eyes. They're not quite holding up. Um, do I need to use my willow charcoal homemade food? You're asking. Um, I find it helpful early on to use that vine charcoal because, or the willow charcoal, 
uh, because it provides a nice layer underneath and it just helps me to warm up. Um, none of the marks are super permanent at that stage, but I think at this point, once I have that initial layer down, most of what I can achieve can be done using the compre compressed charcoal here. All right. So now what I'm doing is I'm starting to lay in some of these darks here. I'm going to start to finish from that, that beak out and make some adjustments as I go uh, to, those, to the proportions in those forms. And I think it's really uh, helpful to have those initial marks on there. It, you'd have something, have something to react to. You know, I see some people that are, are really good at making calculations, figuring things out in their mind, and then executing on the page. It just doesn't work for me. Instead, I need to have something on the page that I'm looking at, and then I can make that decision. Is, you know, is this mark too light, too dark, too big, small, etc.? What needs to change? And as you can see from this overhand grip, everything is done with this overhand grip um, because I want to make sure I'm not utilizing those lines. And I've mentioned it before, but what happens is when we start to draw a line, our brain interprets that as an edge of an object, as a contour more likely. Um, and so um, in order, to, in, the, in the interest of unity and making sure everything feels like it's all part of the same object, I want to try to reduce my use of lines to indicate things. And it gets really tricky because um, some of these shadows that we're looking at are, they, they almost look like lines, they're so thin. Um, but we want to remind ourselves that those aren't lines, those aren't contours, those are thin shadows. Um, and the way we express that on the page can um, it can make a, it can make a big impact on how the viewer or you um, interpret those marks. Now what I'm doing is I'm looking for some of the subtle value shifts in that facial area. So we can see a pin here, for example, that's mostly in uh, in shadow. In shadow, there's a larger share, and I want to kind of. I want my marks to move in a way that reflects the flow of the texture. And, and this is, again, another area where we can, um, we can allow the materials to kind of do their thing. So I've shifted my grip into this. I don't even know what this is. It's some modified overhand grip. Um, but I have, a, I have this pinky kind of stabilizing on the paper. And, and I'm trying to look at the angle of those, those feathers and I'm pushing and pulling across there to try to f find the flow of the feathers, but also express the general shape of the shadows there. And if you roll your pencil as you go, you're constantly at a new point on the core of the pencil. That, that, that edge is the cylinder of the pencil is making contact with the paper at one specific point. So you can make very fine lines using the side of the pencil it, not just the, the tip of the pencil, if that makes sense. So again, two things at once. I'm thinking of the direction of my marks. I'm aligning with the texture, but I'm also trying to express the general shape of the shadows. So underneath this beak, for example, there's this really nice shadow. I'm working my way out. My hands are getting wicked dirty right now. I'm not worried about it, but if you are, I understand. Um, just checking for questions, anything? Nope. How's everybody's? If you're drawing, I'd love to hear how it's going. If you're kind of keeping up and you're at a different stage in the drawing, how's it working for you? So much of this is just about touch. I'm, this is really only utilizing the weight of the pencil on the page. 
there's this other shadow shape out this shape um, that I want to try to indicate. Let's see, okay. Whew. Looks like we're still live, but I'm getting a little error message here. So hopefully it's not going to drop the signal. If it do, if we do lose the signal, just hang on. Um, you know, I'll just reset and we'll be right back. So it's happened before, but we're able to generally bring it back. Um, and if it does uh, drop out, we've had a few instances where the the cable internet is just completely dropped. If that does happen, um, then I will generally go back in and record, finish recording the session, and post that, and then maybe post a new recording altogether. So then you still get that. Um, get the whole demonstration. Um, one of the things that, um, yeah, I think, you know, so people are commenting on uh, the bit rate. Yeah, it, it's kind of slowing down. Let me see. I'm not sure. I'm sure if that's really helping, but um, let's see. Uh, questions here. Use liquid charcoal before. I've never used it, but I have seen it used, and it looks fascinating. Um, I would love to give that a shot. Maybe that's something I can do for one of these these demonstrations. Is, is experiment with that. Um, let's see. Okay, one of the things that have really worked on with you is a lighter touch. It's amazing the difference. That's good to hear. Yeah, a lot of it is about touch. Um, and we don't need a whole lot to make um, marks. And uh, one of the, somebody, I see another, uh, Linda, you're saying I haven't brought in the shading stump. I will be utilizing that. Um, and I, I don't, honestly, I don't know why I haven't at this point. Um, let me give that a shot. So I've got this old one here that I've been using for quite a while. It's pretty well loaded. Um, and it, rather than use that in the center here, I'm going to utilize that in these areas up top that were a little bit softer. And you can see these kind of ridges of the feathers. And, and in general, what I'm doing is I'm placing, pressing, and then flicking upward to suggest that texture there. And then rather than drawing a line, I'm trying to visualize that path along that, that rim of the, the, the face. <laughs> I wish I knew an owl anatomy a little bit better, but uh, you know, I wish I, along in here, I'm, again, same kind of thinking as with the charcoal. And as I mentioned earlier, every material you have is an opportunity to contribute to the form. And so this isn't just about smoothing out materials, it's about utilizing it to help suggest the texture. So this is, I'm finding, is really helpful in that, that edge kind of scruffy area. And I'm not too worried about, I don't want it to read as one continuous line. This is that, what I was talking about, that line of good continuation, the Gestalt principle, is that we're seeing all of these broken marks and our brain is interpreting that as one continual path. And it's actually gonna feel more naturalistic. Um, so sometimes when we when we draw a, a dark line, we over render an edge. It can feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, in part because one of the one of the ways our eyes um, function is that when we our eyes are always moving, and so if if um, you know whatever object we're looking at, we might be looking at one small portion, then we we'll move down to another, and then to another. And our brain is piecing all of that together for us. And so we understand it as one continual edge, even though the visual information that's entering our eyes is different. It's actually being kind of broken up. And we're just seeing little bits and pieces. Our brain pieces that together. And that's exactly what's happening here in the, this Gestalt principle of good continuation, where 
we're seeing all of these broken pieces and our brain is filling in that gap and it actually feels more natural because that's the way our eyes are used to processing visual information. But we, we have a natural tendency and it's very, very natural to want to over-define something. So using the, using the shading stump, this is really helpful down in this area where those feathers become kind of softer and kind of silkier in a way. Um, so I just, I'm holding the, my shading stump in the same way that I was holding the pencil. And I am trying to kind of express that, the flow and the texture of those feathers underneath here. And it's really easy to get caught up in this and just kind of go and stop looking at the subject, um, but keep checking in with the, the reference image. Make sure you're in the right spot. And one of the things we've talked about in the past when dealing with texture um, is that think about, look at the region you are in the bird. So if I'm down in here, I'm gonna to look to, to that region in the reference photo. And rather than, than try to find that specific feather that I'm working on, I wanna think about what are the marks in general doing in that area? Are they thin, are they heavy, are they light? Um, are they you know, vertical, are they flowing? You know, you start try to make a general uh, and quick interpretation of what's happening in that area and then react to that rather than try to stop, find the precise feather that you're working on and coming back to it on the page. Um, you can fi you'll find that you'll, you can get through the drawing much faster when you do that and you capture the overall essence of it. And then once you have that, you can decide for yourself how, how precise do you need to be to feel comfortable with your own drawing. So it's kind of making a few quick marks and you can kind of hear the rhythm that I've got going on here. A few quick marks and then looking at the subject, a few quick marks and looking at the subject and you're qu I'm quickly taking in, um, taking stock of where I'm at and reacting. But I know that if I get sucked into the drawing, it's easy to go and completely forget about the reference. It's one of the things I notice a lot um, you know, when teaching beginning drawing is that and I'd ask my students to, to do that. I, you know, just say, let's just go, let's just draw. I'm gonna set up a still life, something to draw from life. I'm not gonna give you any instruction, just go. And then about halfway through, I want them to, I ask them to think, when was the last time you looked at the subject? And for the most part, most students realize that they hadn't looked back at the subject since the first 30 seconds when we set up the still life. It's very natural for us to look up a subject, take a mental snapshot, then work from a drawing and, and from that mental snapshot without revisiting our, the, the subject. We stop looking at the subject. Um, and as a result, those drawings tend to be informed to the same degree that that mental snapshot has. You know, we can't take in a lot of information in 30 seconds. But when we keep coming back to it and we take thousands of mental snapshots throughout the drawing process, our brain takes all of that together and, and comes to a better understanding of the, the subject. So um, kind of reflect on that yourself. How often are you looking up at the subject? And just kind of take stock of that. Um, one of the th cool things is we had a, um, we had a, a Monet exhibit here in Denver um, not too long ago, and they had a video playing. You know, uh, and they, somebody had re recorded video of him working, and you'll see. You know, you see in that video, and you can find it online, I believe. Um, you know, he'll he'll take three, four, five looks at the subject before he even makes a mark, and then he'll make a mark or two, and then a look, 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 mark. Um, and it was it's really profound to see that level of observation taking place. And pointing that out to, I took my daughter in her class to that, um, to that exhibit, and pointing that out, it was it was interesting to see, for them to see that. Oh my yeah, oh my gosh, you're not. He's not. He's spending seventy five percent of his time looking at the subject, not his painting. But all of that then helps the painting. Those marks that he makes on the on the canvas are that much more precise and reflective of his experience. So. All right, since I picked up this shading stump, I haven't been able to let it go. 
<laughs> but you can see that I'm working my way around it, uh, around the center of the head. Um, and so there might be some areas in here where I might be able to kind of soften. So I want to, but I want to be careful because what's what's um, particularly um, noticeable in this um, in the central face here is just those those fine details. So I want to be careful. And when I'm doing this, when I'm making my marks, I still want to make sure that I'm reflecting the the structure and the flow of those feathers. Uh, this beak is an area where I can really kind of smooth out and create some contrast between the smooth values here and then the rough values or the rough marks of the feathers around it. All right. So this is starting to come together. And as you can see, like the texture is starting to be suggested there, and I may not need to do a whole lot more. Um, I've seen this area along in here, there's kind of a bit of a scalloped kind of overlapping of the forms that for me, I, I don't do well getting bogged down in those details. I get claustrophobic uh, when I'm working in, in tight areas like that. So um, I'm just going to suggest those, but for you, you may really enjoy kind of capturing each and every little detail in there. There's a little bit of a ridge of light along in here. And I'm, in general, as I'm making my marks around those feathers, I'm thinking about placing the mark and then flicking outward, and that helps to create the form of the, the feathers. And one of the things I start to see along in here and here is there's, you can see these lines in the, in the pattern that kind of roll through the, um, roll through that kind of scruff there. I want to be careful not to overstate those. Um, let's see, Cindy, uh, you're asking today you use tone paper, drawing paper. Do you use charcoal paper with charcoal? Um, yes, we, in, in this series, I've kind of changed that up. So in some of the episodes, we've been using, um, a cotton rag, a Hanamula kind of cotton rag paper. Um, and then also a smoother kind of drawing paper. Um, in this case, I wanted to have that toned surface. This is a Strathmore paper. I wanted to use that toned surface so that we can pull those lights out on top and those lights will help to um, capture that texture, I think a bit better. And it's just kind of fun to shake things up a little bit. Think both in terms of positive space and negative space. And I'm trying to think about the structure and the flow of those feathers around the eyes. I feel like I'm getting a little bit too bogged down uh, with the the shading stump here, so. Uh, but let me, uh, so I just need to be careful. As I'm working with the shading stump too, just like with the charcoal, I'm constantly rolling my, rolling it in my fingers so that I'm, I'm engaging a new section of it. It also helps to create, uh-oh, so, okay, okay, good, we're back. Thought I was, gonna, <laughs> I was losing the connection there again. I have internet issues lately. Um, but I wonder if how many of you are seeing that also the calibration to the values. I notice that when I'm looking up and in the the image here on the screen is that it just feels like everything's dull. Our brain really wants to, or my brain at least wants to think think of this paper as being white. Um, and so it just seems like it, the camera's out of focus or or something or um you know not quite exposed properly um but it is and so i, I can find i find myself calibrating to that um and it's a it's a help healthy thing to kind of make sure that we we don't take that for granted okay let's see Uh, Alice, you're saying liquid charcoal is great for large backgrounds and erases easily. That's good to know. I'm excited to, I think you're, I think you've convinced me to try that out. I need to order some, uh, and using a, you know, watercolor brush. But if you have any suggestions about that, let me know.
Okay, I'm just gonna I find myself getting bogged down here. I'm gonna come back to it, but what, I'm gonna, what I wanna do is just kinda clear my mind a little bit. I'm gonna move down here where there's a little bit less at stake in terms of accuracy. And so I'm just kind of working down here, clearing my mind a little bit. I'm gonna let this, I uh, need to get a little bit of value done in here. So I'm grabbing my compressed charcoal and I'm gonna suggest this wing that's um, kind of tucked under here and the same with this one. Just to kind of anchor it to the bottom of the paper here. And then I can come back in and add some kind of these darker areas and I'm not worried about precision at this point and matching the um, reference photo one to one. As long as I get it close, I'm gonna be happy You know, I think, again, that's something that you want to establish for yourself, your tolerance for inaccuracy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all have our own um, kind of internal barometer for that. You know, say, when is it, it's just, it needs to be more precise or it can be more, um, uh, you know, more flexible in that area. I see that a lot with landscape painters. You know, I see, for me, I generally try to get those proportions correct because I want to, I really want to capture the the specific forms in front of me in the landscape where then i see other artists who uh, use the landscape as kind of a jumping off point and then we'll move a tree or change the scale of a mountain or something like that to create some sort of uh, other expression and it's all it's all good it's just a matter of kind of being clear in, about your intentions um, okay right in here i feel like i need to define this a little bit more. So I'm just shortening up my marks in here to reflect the changing texture down in this. And I've got this overhand grip I'm a, and I'm, I'm stabilizing it a bit with my, my index finger here to give me just a little bit more control. Um, I think what I need to do is outline that light part of the beak And then build the darks around it to get kind of consume that dark outline that I that I just made. So again, mostly mostly applying darks. Um, we, I'm, I've erased out a few of the light areas, but I haven't really done a whole lot with that. And, and a lot of this is, again, I'm kind of building up into the eye area where I'm going to add a bit more detail later. I can find myself mentally tightening up as I'm starting to get a little bit more confined in here. Got to breathe. <laughs> it's something I, I forget to do a lot. I'll find myself holding my breath as I work and then just gulping in air. Um. All right. I think what I want to do is kind of express this, do some negative drawing, using my kneaded eraser to pull out some of the areas that are a little bit lighter. Uh, if anything, those areas are going to receive the, the white chalk in a bit. All right, working my way into the eyes, very similar. So uh, when did we, do? oh, we did the smile last. Um, and we talked a bit about that in, in portraiture, the idea of working on the space around the features and then building into it so that you're establishing a context for it. So like the mouth doesn't exist in isolation. It isn't a single thing that's placed on the face. It's part of a network and a, a system of muscles and tendons and things like that, you know, in the, the skeleton be below it. So we want to try to think of all of it at once. And so this type of thinking applies here as well. We're kind of working into the eyes so that the eyes are part of 
the head. They're not something that's stuck on there. Um, so as we go into this area here, um, oh, I have a good question there, but I, I just want to finish this thought here. As we, um, as we move into the eyes, I, I, I generally start kind of inside the form and work my way up to the edge um, and then to, to find that edge. And if I need to put a line, I'll do that rather than draw an outline and then fill it in. Um, but there is a question here from Heather's asking, how do you know when to deviate from the reference photo for a better composition and when not to? And that is really, again, up to you. Um, there is, in my mind, no hard and fast rule, but I can tell you what, I, what I'm looking for when I'm adjusting my composition. Um, there, because there are general kind of rules to composition that you know that are built on how we interpret visual information, um, but it, for me, what I look at is you know if if my job in say in the landscaper with this is to capture a certain experience, how does the composition reflect that? Um, and if you know if the composition just um, you know, so say, you know, I, I did recently, I did a, a painting of a, a bale of hay, right? Uh, or these, these, these multiple bales all kind of stacked on one another. Um, if that is my focal point, I need to have it placed on the canvas in a way that expresses that. So then that becomes what the, the, the uh, painting is all about. Um, if, if my, what drew me to that scene instead was the entirety of it, and, and those hay bales were just a portion of that, then I would change the composition to reflect that. So when you look at it initially, you see the entirety of the scene. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes down to kind of locking into that. And for the longest time, um, I really struggled with it. And it's something I really still struggle with as well, um, because the, the biggest challenge for me in terms of composition is locking into what the subject is. In this case, it's the owl. I don't have any other information about, uh, you know, that, that, that's conflicting with that. So I can just focus on the owl and I can place it, I'm putting it right smack in the middle of the paper. So there's no question what this thing's about. But in a landscape, when you've got, when I've got, you know, mountains and pastures, I may have a creek, a tree, things like that. You have all of these features that could take center stage. And when I wasn't clear on it, or I'd get excited by all of it, I would try to make all of it the focal point, and then as a result, nothing became a focal point. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, for example, there's some water towers in the area that are really kind of fascinating to me. And so, um, if I were to go and paint them, I need to fig I need to think clearly about, you know, how I want to place that, so that it the placement of it reflects my own um, you know, weighting of the, the objects in the scene of importance, the weighting of importance there. So hopefully that gives you something to kind of chew on for a bit. I, you know, it's, it's really, it's really difficult, um, you know, because there's sometimes when I'll, I'll intentionally make a bad compositional choice I, where I do not want to move things in the scene because to me, fidelity of the scene. I want it to be true. I want it to say, this is where I'm at. And I don't want to change proportions and, and placement of things. And it may just lead to a crappy composition, but it captured my experience because things don't often line up exactly the way they should in nature. Um, but, or sometimes though, you know, if you're doing it for the sake of the painting itself, you need to move things around. But, so all that to say is that it's a tricky thing to answer. It looks like some other questions are coming in. So, so I'm just darkening these areas. I'm paying attention to the, um, the reflected light in there. And I want to pull that out just a little bit more with my kneaded eraser. And I'm going to continue to refine them. Uh, Wilma is saying something important for me to remember is be clear about your intentions. Um, I think that is a very good thing to have in mind. Sometimes you don't know what that what those intentions are going to be in a painting, and it may just take some working out. You know, I'll work on a painting or I'll drawing, and I'll I'll try a few things out, um, and 
and as I look at it and I might say, you know, that's not really working for me. You know, it, what, what this painting is ultimately about is this distant mountain, you know, then, and then I might change the composition to kind of reflect that. Um, that was, that's what actually happened. If we think back to the, um, the, the smile episode, the previous one, my initial attempts were about, I was drawing the whole portrait and it wasn't working out. And I felt like it worked out better when I reminded myself and like that this is really about understanding that smile. And I cropped out a whole lot more and just brought that smile into focus. And then once that became um, evident to me, my, my mentally I was more focused and I think the drawing turned out better. The beak, yeah, the beak is crooked. <laughs> Isn't it? Um, So let me bring that under here. That's what I love about drawing is that you can always, always fix things. I'm going to darken this area underneath here, try to pop that beak out a little bit. Thank you for that observation about that beak. I lost track of who posted that, but thank you. <laughs> um, that's why we're drawing together. Hopefully that's a little bit better. I haven't really given much thought to that. So, and I think what I want to do is use this eraser to Kind of refine that a little bit more. And these feathers that come in on top of it really are distinctive. So we're gonna, we're gonna focus on that in a little bit as well. Um, uh, I got a question about what materials we're using. So you'll find a list of materials in the description below. So charcoal pencils, I'm gonna be using chalk on top of this. This is a, a tanned um, toned paper, a Strathmore paper that I'm using. And one of the things that I'm seeing is that because I'm working at this slanted surface, I find that I'm, I'm adjusting and correcting the, the proportions a little bit. So I need to make sure that I continue to, to reference the screen that's in front of me that has the shot up from the camera overhead. Um, I had kind of lost sight of that. So if you're in that same boat, uh, make sure that you're setting your paper up at a distance so you're, it's vertical to you and that will help you to see any sort of perspective distortions. In general, I would I prefer to work vertically but it doesn't really kind of work for this live streaming setup. All right, so now what I'm doing in here, I'm just kind of thinking through some of these other details. I think we can start to add some of the white, uh, the white on top of this, but I want to, this is something that's kind of significant in here, this dark area. So I want to make sure that that's reflected in it. And then there's that change in color, that, that orange around the eyes that I want to address. Because right in here, it's too flat. And it's difficult to interpret the value of that color. Using that kneaded eraser to kind of flick out some of those feathers that are on top of the eye. All right, uh, I just wanna check out, I see a bunch of questions coming in. Uh, this is being recorded, so you can certainly w look back and watch the whole thing. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay, it looks like we're back here, but um, uh, Anita's asking, how many times do you attempt landscape while painting? Um, do you make multiple paintings? I often do. When I find a subject, there are a few places here. I'm in northern Colorado outside of Fort Collins. 
Um, and there are a few spots that I find myself coming to frequently. Um, and each time I learn something more about that space, you know, you think Monet did that same thing. You know, he'd work in series and you kind of understand the landscape a bit better. Um, the, uh, let's see what's going on there. Um, but, and then in general, you know, I do, I do, you know, if I do a hundred paintings, if I can get a couple that really work that I'm happy with, I'm feeling good. <laughs> like most of them, it just aren't going to work, especially when you're working on plein air, you know, it, uh, you know, you just, it's not going to always work out. And it's, for me, it's all about that experience. Um, and you know, it just being out there and painting and sometimes it just doesn't work. And I say more than sometimes, a majority of the times it doesn't really work, but it doesn't make that painting experience bad. I've learned, generally learned something from every painting. Um, but yes, and if there's something that I've, that I've done and I'm like, you know, I really need to go back. This has a lot of potential, but I didn't quite get it. Then I'll go back and, um, and repaint that subject or come back at a different time of day. You know, maybe I'll be out somewhere and say, hey, you know, this is, I'm curious what this is going to be like in, in the morning versus evening. And maybe that would make for a better painting. So. All right, so now I think what we're going to do is I want to kind of kind of think through where I'm going to be putting some of these light areas using the kneaded eraser. I'm pulling out some of the lighter spots, but recognizing that the tone paper is serving as some sort of midtone. It's not like a middle gray, but it's a midtone of some sort. Um, it's not the white of the paper. So I'm looking for the shapes of the light. I'm going to try to clean up some of the charcoal a little bit especially right in here. And I, when I'm making these marks, I'm trying to also reflect the flow of the texture as again, we're contributing to the form. Uh, Greg is asking, um, do I hold my paintbrushes in a similar way? Yes. When I, when I'm painting, here's my paintbrushes here, I typically hold them in overhand fashion, so I'm scrubbing like this. Um, and then when I need to, I'll, you know, I can switch over to this to kind of get a, a more controlled grip to a tripod grip. So, but generally it's overhand and I don't treat my brushes very well. Um, I scrub and beat the, the junk out of them, so. Um, so, and I, I think of charcoal as a very painterly medium, so, this is a very similar process to how I might work on a painting, uh, kind of think through the structure of a painting. But it is different focusing on a single object versus an entire landscape, thinking about an object versus the space. Um, so it's just something to, to kind of keep in mind. All right, just clearing my head a little bit, I'm gonna refine some of these edges. So as I go along this edge, I'm not thinking about a solid line, but if I break up that line, it helps to define that edge in just a few key areas. And then right up in here, it's got these cool feathers hanging up out here. I went to graduate school in Alaska and right outside the studio window was a, a great horned owl that had a nest and we saw the, the babies being born, her protecting them from the ravens up there. It was awesome. But of course they have these cool, you know, horns sticking out there. So, okay, uh, that was a little side tangent, just to say that owls are awesome. I know we're getting a little bit long here, but um, pulling out the, uh, the chalk here now. Um, now, this is going to be used to create some of the finer detail, but I want you to notice that I'm not gonna be using the point of the pencil a whole lot. So, um, it's, I'm gonna be utilizing in the same way that I was using the charcoal, kind of on its side, maybe putting a little bit more pressure higher up so I get some of that finer control. But if I utilize it on its side, I'm constantly refining that point. Um, let's see, I just wanna see the quick questions. How do you identify the light sources of a reference picture? How do you tell if there's multiple? Do you, do you, how do you tell if your eyes are tricking you? Um, all right, so there's a question about the light sources. Now in this, uh, squinting really helps to 
prioritize value relationships and see the forms light and shadow. Gets rid of the details. It tends to darken the darks and lighten the lights. So squint and you can start to see these larger shadow shapes. Um, also try to find reference photos that have a dramatic light source. And of course, when it's, when it's really dramatic, you're gonna know where the light source is coming from. But a lot of color photographs are so flooded with light that you lose that form. So I think it's really important to choose um, reference photos uh, mindfully um, and especially when working on a drawing, um, try to f choose photos that have a solid light structure to them so you can clearly see the shadow forms. And so here what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at this, these, this ridge of these feathers here and I'm trying to align my pencil so that it, it reflects the, the flow of those feathers kind of working into the eyes there. And it's more intense along the top of that ridge. And as I'm going through, I'm constantly rolling the pencil in my fingers to, um, to get to a, a fresh, clean um, part of the, the charcoal. And as we come down over the beak, you get these fine lines. And even as I make a kind of a longer mark, I'm kind of rolling it in my fingers. But I find that when work these lights on top of a charcoal, um, utilizing it on its side, it tends to kind of, you're bringing the charcoal on top, right? And it's pushing that charcoal down. You're bringing the chalk on top and pushing the charcoal down. If I switch to an overhand grip like this, then it's, uh, it's more likely to kind of embed into the charcoal, if that makes sense. So I want this white chalk to kind of float on top of the charcoal and you scraping it on its side, rolling in the fingers, uh, um, I find is most effective in that. So it's these, these kind of short squiggles um, moving in towards the center of the eye. Trying to, see, trying to capture that overall texture there. It's not a solid white form. But you can see now that our eyes are starting to calibrate to the white that's being added. Now all of our brain, all of a sudden my brain is saying, wait a minute, I started interpreting this tan as white. Now I see this white and it's completely different. So. Um, excellent. Uh, how do you deal with paper that has, bro has been broken from too much pressure with the charcoal? That is a, a tricky one. Um, you know, you see some, some artists that, you know, just, they just continue to work. And maybe they'll even put a new piece of paper underneath it or on top of it and just keep kind of going. Um, but sometimes the charcoal just gets loaded with, or the paper just gets loaded with charcoal and there's not much you can really do about that. Um, if you feel like the materials have stopped working for you, um, I, I encourage students to continue to work on it so that it, um, you know, you, in a way you're practicing taking things too far. You know what that line is. So the next time you're working, you're kind of aware of the limits of the materials. Also experiment with different materials. See what different, what papers work best for you. This mixed media, or this drawing paper here, kind of works well for mixed media, and um, and I think it works really well with this this chalk. So um, I like utilizing it, but it kind of works well with my particular kind of sensitivity of the material, my my touch uh, of the material. So, but it it may not all work for you. Uh, so I'm just looking for these lighter areas. It's a little bit more kind of broad in here. So still utilizing the side of the pencil and where it's a more broad area, I'm rolling in my fingers, so I'm sharpening that point. Um, let's see. Are there general tips for getting the proportions? Yes, you know, we kind of covered that a little bit in the beginning. Um, I'd recommend, you know, if you look back in the series, this is episode 41, 42, something like that. Um, in the earlier episodes, I really spent a lot of time focusing on tools for controlling proportions, but generally sight measuring is a tool to do that. And I use that a little bit here. Um, the idea that you want to take an evaluation of the height versus the width. And you get that and everything else kind of builds around there. 
Um, and then what I did is I used the, the height of the eye as a standard unit of measure to compare to the space around it. Right in here, I'm, you know, I'm picking up, I didn't really clean off this area, so I'm picking up a bunch of charcoal. So I'm rolling that pencil around my fingers, creating a softer mark. I'm gonna kind of roll in along here as well. You can see how it starts to really suggest that texture. You don't need to be super explicit and draw every little feather. Our brains are designed to fill in gaps. You know, we take in so much information throughout the day, like trillions of bits of information were taken in and our brain distills that down. Uh, so it's really good at, at processing lots of information. And in a way it's, it's easy to get kind of overwhelmed um, and create a drawing that has too much detail that it, it makes, it almost becomes difficult and kind of un, uncomfortable for the eye to, to view. So, but you're going to find what the, you know, the, the level of detail that works best for you. For some of you, this may not be sufficient. You may need to add more. And for others, you may say, you know, this is, this is good where it is. It, it captures the overall essence of the, of the bird. Um, let's see. Do I ever, Alice is asking if I ever um, convert these to black and white. Um, for the purposes of this, I, I don't. I, um, I like to work in color, but that, for, for me, the, the reason I'm here drawing is to improve my skills when drawing on location and drawing from life. Um, I don't have the ability to, to work directly from an owl, which would be the best thing to do for me. Um, and so the next best thing is to work from a color photo, especially one that's on a, on a screen here. Um, if I, and so I'm trying to kind of practice interpreting color as value. And so it's really about the kind of the practice of drawing, um, but rather than, um, you know, the, the finished product per se. You know, if this were a commission and somebody were paying me to do this and I would utilize all the tools available and I would, you know, be drawing, you know, you have a, I'd have a color printout, I'd have a black and white, I'd probably project onto this, or I'd, I'd do a, some sort of transfer to get the proportions really dialed in. Um, but this is, for me, it's more important to develop this, the skills of sight measuring and build up my hand-eye coordination. And so I'm uh, trying to embrace that challenge, um, if that makes sense, so. All right, now let's see. Oh, I like this. There are these thin feathers that come up like eyebrows here. Um, and I'm trying to visualize where I go, how big they should be. I'm trying to hold it in my mind, and then I want to try to get it in one strike. There we go. I think I need a little bit more. So, and just with the light, like just with the, as with the dark, so the lights are sensitive to pressure. So I can just do make some you know light marks. I can make heavy marks to really pull out these lighter areas. Um, you know, very similar to what we did in that the bonfire episode. Um, you know, utilizing the toned paper. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm evaluating the, the image in front of me um, to see what is clear, what's not, what areas need to be refined a little bit. But I think we're getting pretty close to, to it. You know, I can continue to work on this. We could all stick with these for you know, an extra couple hours if we want to, just kind of refining the details but it may not contribute a whole lot to our understanding of that, of the form here. Um, so I might just call it, call it good soon. Um, I just want to kind of double check, look through here um, for additional questions. Is there an official term for that? Do you, uh, for, like breaking the paper, do you find your students apply too much pressure? It's often, and that's, you know, one of the reasons I like to use this overhand grip is specifically for pressure. So when you're holding a tripod grip like this, the point is engaged with the paper. And it's, you can control pressure by easing up on your wrist, but it becomes quite a bit more challenging to do that. 
when you scrape on a side, you can go anywhere from using the weight of the pencil itself to kind of gradually leaning in to apply more pressure. And then, and also it's floating on the top more. When using the side, it's, it's creating less pressure overall on the surface. And so as a result, it's, it's gonna be easier to pull up the, the material and it's not gonna kind of break the paper as you're ta talking about. So if you are struggling with that, try really utilizing the, the, just the weight of the pencil in an overhand grip. And if anything, then just lightly hold it towards the back in your fingertips so that you can't apply any pressure and see what quality of mark you end, end, end up with because it, you may find that that's sufficient but part of what we we get trained to do is to apply really kind of bear down when we're writing and it's hard to break that sometime. Um, I, Professor Blue, I did not study any owl anatomy. I, I'm sure it'd be more fascinating if I had done that you know just for me to kind of know that but I know very little about birds, um, you know, and in art school we took human anatomy and it was very helpful for figure drawing, but I've forgotten all of that as well, so, um, but no, I did not do any, um, any anatomical study. Um, uh, M. Donahue, you're asking, how do you keep the white white? And that's tricky, so try to lift off the charcoal as much as possible before you lay it down. And again, just kind of utilize the side. If it does start to get gray, um, you can go back in. Let's see if there's an area like right here. You might be able to lift off some of the white and then try again right on top and see if that helps you to, uh, to get some of that texture. So kind of lift it back up with a kneaded eraser and then try to apply it again. Um, uh, Anita, you're using a mechanical eraser instead of the white and, and instead of the white and getting somewhat similar texture. That's perfect. So that the mechanical eraser gets you that fine edge. Um, and I'll often do that with, with a, my rubber eraser. What I can do is take a razor blade and shave that off and get a really fine strip. And that can be enough sometimes to get some of that fine detail. So thank you for sharing that. So if you don't have the white charcoal, what Anita is saying is, um, uh, utilizing a, a sharp or kind of fine mechanical eraser can sometimes pull out some of these light areas. Um, let me see. Oop, I just broke that tip off there. So hopefully this is helping. If you if you were struggling with confidence in materials, hopefully this is helping in some way. Again, you kind of just utilizing the materials to suggest texture and. Here, I'm just kind of blending this area a little bit. Um, let me see. Uh, Aida, you're asking if this white charcoal, this is actually white chalk. Let me see, I think I do have white, I do have some white charcoal, so let me see how this works. And it works, you know, very similarly. I kind of find that the white, white chalk might be a little bit better, but this is, this is actually working out pretty nicely. Um, so white, yeah, white charcoal would, will work. I don't really know what the difference is. Something that I can, might be able to research for the next episode. Um, <laughs> it's been a hoot, Rosalie. Awesome. Thank you for that. I, <laughs> I'm kicking myself that I didn't think of that. Um, uh, Derwent Chinese white is the best white I've ever used. Oh, I got to try that, Tammy. Um, I think that's a, yeah, Derwent makes some really good materials there. What is this? I don't, I don't know what this is. I kind of, kind of had sharpened away um, the, uh, the brand for this one. So I'm not sure what chalk this is. These are generals, um, charcoal pencils that I've got. Um, but really any, you know, you find a, a, a reputable brand, you know, any, you know, artist grade materials are gonna get, kind of get you what you want, but find, find what works for you. Uh, what I what I'd hate to have happen is, you know, you know, somebody never, you know, not create something because they don't feel like they have the right materials. But um, this, yeah, this, uh, these generals pencils work really well for me. Um, yeah, Derwent makes some fantastic materials. Prismacolor. Um, so let me see other questions as well. I only have pastels and black and white pastel sticks have done decently well. Excellent. Yeah, those, I mean, pastels are fantastic. You're going to be able to get a nice range of values, I think, with those. 
but I think we're pretty close to done. So I'm going to hang out here, work for a little bit, see if there's any lingering questions here. But if not, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me here, sharing your experiences. Um, we're going to be back on Monday. So we meet Monday, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Apples. We're doing apples on Monday, I believe, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I always forget. Um, but we've got some waterfalls coming up. We've got some apples. What else do I have? Um, oh, I had a, a reference photo I had taken from Mesa Verde National Park a couple years ago, or last summer. And I'm really excited about that one. Um, so doing some more landscape work. We've done some figurative work. And we've got another flower coming up as well. So um, check the schedule. If you go to artistnetwork.com, the Drawing Together page, you can find all the show pages for each episode where people have been sharing their work. Some fantastic portraits have been coming in. Um, wonderful smiles that I've been seeing. The wave drawings have been, fan been fantastic. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, and so I, I really enjoy seeing all of you sharing your works there. Um, and if you're new and you're not sure what we're talking about, uh, check for the link below in the description. We'll take you to Artist Network and you'll find the Drawing Together pages and, and you'll find the schedule there as well. Um, so be sure to subscribe and hit the little alert button so you know when the next one is posted. Um, but again, we do this every Monday, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I am really grateful again for you all joining me, asking these wonderful questions, sharing your experiences. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, architectural work, Greg, you're asking, I think you asked that before. I am, <laughs> so the, the Mesa Verde one, I'm a little bit architectural, but it's pretty old. I'm trying to find a really good reference photo and I'd like to take it myself. Um, so I need to be more diligent about doing that. So I am making that a priority, Greg, <laughs> and I will do that. Um, yes, I think you're, and I'm, I don't know why, I think I'm just a little intimidated by it, trying to get a, an architectural drawing done. Uh, during one episode. So it may be a two-parter or something like that where we focus on perspective and and other things. So um, so I appreciate it. Thank you all for all the comments. Thank you all for joining me. I know we had some technical hiccups, but it looks like we made it through. So I appreciate all of you. And I will see you all next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay cool. <laughs> Professor Blue, I... I have no routine for my diet and shampoo. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thank you, Tammy. I appreciate you all for joining. So, all right, signing off. Talk to you later. Oh, Jean, let me see. Having trouble finding the link below. If uh, I will try to post that once the recording comes up right after this, I'll make sure that there's a link in there. But it should be in in the in the description. If you go to artistnetwork.com. Right at the top of the page, you'll see a link for drawing together. That's where it's going to lead you to is that. So hopefully you can find that. Um, but I will, I will check the description as soon as we're done here. All right, Linda, I'm glad, to, uh, glad you shared that about working with just on the white paper. Hopefully your, your drawing turned out. I look forward to seeing it. You can also use this white charcoal on top of um, just on white paper. So um, if you need to kind of bring back some of the, the lights there. So, okay. Now I'm signing off. <laughs>